Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-empowerment. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you and your company stay relevant in an era of rapid change and 10x your results in both your professional and personal life. Each week, I'll bring you corporate innovators, entrepreneurs, authors, keynote speakers, and thought leaders such as Steve Blank, David Allen, Brad Feld, Tim Harford, Karen Dillon, Jenny Blake, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, Pascal Finette, Ryan Blair, and Ash Moria, to name just a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some quick digestible insights to help you end your week on a high as you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus an innovation hub school and consultancy based in Melbourne, Australia and Singapore that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methods and tools to navigate change and survive and thrive in an era of rapid disruption. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 185. Today, I welcome back to the show for a third time, which is a record for Future Squared guests, the one and only Tim Harford. Tim is an economist, author, TED speaker, journalist, and broadcaster. He's the author of Messi, the million selling undercover economist, senior columnist at the Financial Times, and presenter of Radio 4's More or Less, and host of the popular BBC podcast, 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy which is incidentally enough the name of his new book and the subject of today's conversation. From the plow to artificial intelligence, from Gillette's disposable razor to Ikea's Billy bookcase, Tim recounts each invention's own memorable story and introduces you to the characters who developed them, profited from them, and were ruined by them. Former Future Squared guest and widely respected economist and custodian of MarginalRevolution.com, Tyler Cowan, says that Tim's new book reaffirms his status as one of the greatest contemporary popular writers on economics. Tim and I go an inch deep and a mile wide in this episode. In particular, we discuss three key topics. Why most companies that invest in technology and innovation fail, and what those that succeed do differently. What should government's role be in developing and regulating technology? And why we shouldn't be looking at emerging technologies in isolation and how the most transformative technologies often aren't the most glamorous. I really enjoyed my last two conversations with Tim, as well as the 50 Things podcast and book, so I just couldn't wait to have him back on the show to broaden my thinking. So with that, I bring you the one and only Tim Harford. Welcome back to the show, Tim. Oh, it's great to be on the show again. No, it's an absolute pleasure, and you're our record holder now. You're the first guest we've had on the show three times. We've had a few guys on twice, but you're the first guy to be here three times. So, uh, I don't know. We, we must send you some kind of an accolade for that, some kind of a little trophy or something. <laughs> well, records are made to be broken. I'm sure I won't be the last person to, to do the triple. This is true. This is true. Um, well, congratulations, Tim. It seems like you've been quite busy since we last spoke, which was uh, coinciding with the release of your last book, Messy. Um, you've now released 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy, which, incidentally, is also the name of a BBC podcast you host. Tell us a little bit about how the book came to fruition yeah it's it's been lots of fun working on it so it it began with an idea for this bbc podcast and quickly turned into a book as well and the idea the clues in the title it's 50 things that made the modern economy so it's it's an excuse for me to take a particular invention or idea anything um, as you know as solid and traditional as concrete or the plow or as ethereal and new as um, seller feedback mechanisms or uh, the limited liability company, pretty ethereal, not so new. Um, and, And with each of these ideas, to tell a little story and to make a point about how the economy works. The thing about economics, it's often quite it's quite abstract. Sometimes it's quite uh, it's quite dusty, mm-hmm. and but I've always thought that economics is incredibly vibrant and relevant to the lives we lead. And being able to tell these stories and pick on these individual inventors or these ideas or unintended consequences, it's a it's a great way to uh, to explain about economics. Yeah, and um, on picking out individual inventors or unintended consequences, that's one thing I really liked about the book is that rather than just focus on, say, 50 modern technologies such as the computer, you were very intentional about identifying 50 inventions that 
had far-reaching and unexpected, whether they were economic, social, political consequences. Um, take air conditioning, for example, where it created the conditions for computers to survive increased uh, performance demands. Um, it created the conditions for cities like Singapore and Dubai to both develop and thrive. And yeah, so tell me a little bit about that thought process in terms of picking these inventions rather than just going for the obvious ones. Yeah, I mean, some of them are obvious. The, the diesel engine is in there, for example. It's a reasonably obvious invention, but um, a lot of them are, are um, a slightly sideways look about uh, the way the economy works. And really, the um, uh, of course, I wanted to give a, a, a good spread of uh, geographical areas, mm-hmm. some old, some new, uh, different industries. So some are to do with food, some are energy, some are transport, some are IT. So I wanted that spread. But the most important thing was, um, could I tell an interesting and hopefully surprising story yeah. about this thing? Could I tell you something new? Was there a new angle? Uh, and so that's why I didn't want to pick something like the car. Because, I mean, there's so much to say. You couldn't get it into a, a, a thousand-word chapter or a, or a nine minute program yeah. um but you, you you pick something like the diesel engine and you tell the story of or i tell the story of of rudolf diesel this tragic german inventor and his his aim that he was going to get these things working on peanuts and mm-hmm. did he kill him did he kill himself or was he assassinated by big oil i mean it, it just, it, just really 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 good fun um but the the idea as i say is is there a story to tell? So yeah. one of my favorite inventions is barbed wire. Yeah. Um, and that's not because barbed wire is a tremendously sophisticated technology. It's obviously not. It's not even because the story of how it was invented is that interesting. It isn't. Lots of people were trying to make a fencing technology. This particular guy, J.F. Glidden, he kind of figured out you know, the right way to do it. And he invented recognizably modern barbed wire. That's not why it's in the book. It's in the book because it stands for a technology that enforces property rights and has all kinds of good and sometimes very bad consequences as a result. And it completely reshaped the Midwest uh, to the great disadvantage, both of the old time cowboys and of the Native Americans to the advantage of settlers who Abraham Lincoln was trying to get out uh, to to farm this land. So, I mean, like many technologies, we think of technologies as being things that solve problems for us. And of course they do, but there's so much more than that. They, they create winners, they create losers, they have real unintended consequences to them. Yeah, and I guess that's a common theme that emerges throughout the book, which is that technology does create winners and losers, and that oftentimes it occurs before we have, say, hypothetically, or quote-unquote, time to blink. And I guess there's lessons in that for today's uh, large incumbents of industry, um, particularly as things like machine learning get better, automation becomes more widespread, um, blockchain goes on to threaten the upheaval of almost everything we know. I guess there's lessons in there for leaders of industry today to take heed and say, hey, you know, this will create winners and losers, and potentially we need to start acting now to be on the right side of it. Uh, absolutely, and and um, responding to disruptive technology was a was a theme of one of my earlier books, Adapt. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the interesting things that has come out of fifty things that made the modern economy is um, that the inventions that are going to make the difference are not always the inventions that you mm-hmm. think. So we have a tendency to focus on the spectacular stuff. So the flying cars are the cliche, but of course we think about artificial intelligence, supercomputers, um, machine learning, we think about uh, self-driving cars, we think about nuclear fusion. Um, off, I mean, obviously, they are potentially very important, but often the things that make the difference are super simple, uh, and they make a difference because they're cheap. So one of the great examples from history is paper. Everybody focuses on the Gutenberg printing press as being this revolutionary technology, yeah. but it doesn't make any economic sense without paper. And paper was just hanging around as an unexploited technology uh, for 1,500 years, really. It, it only it was invented in China about 2,000 years ago, sitting on the fringes of Europe for centuries and finally embraced in like the 13 and 1400s and then very very quickly the printing press comes along um, because it's only when you can mass produce a writing surface it makes any sense to start mass producing writing. Yeah. In, in the more modern age I, I look at things like 
very very cheap sensors for example as a technology that we yeah you know, we're aware sensors are important and they yeah you know, they're generating information but they they tend not to be the things we focus on mm. so with self-driving cars i think the more the thoughtful people thinking about self-driving cars see them as yeah sure they're self-driving but they're also moving arrays of sensors cameras they're going to be everywhere that's going to change a lot of things privacy surveillance um urban design uh, and and it's these cheap simple things that it's very very easy to overlook mm. and it's also the uh convergence of those things coming together like you said there paper and the printing press or uh sensors converging with you know internet of things technology and data analytics that together then um unlocks vast reserves of data that people can go on and make decisions with and you talk about that in your book with an example is the barcode plus the shipping container equals globalization and today again you could say cloud plus analytics plus machine learning plus blockchain could go on to create vast new reserves of innovation and wealth and i guess the lesson there is not to look at any particular technology regardless of how large or how small in isolation see it as part of a bigger picture yeah which makes things i mean incredibly difficult to predict but yeah i mean uh, another example from history is um the elevator actually the elevator brake because the elevator is really old but the safe the safety elevator the elevator with a brake the skyscraper which is built on um uh, reinforced concrete and steel mass transit so the underground the subway and air conditioning um those things are not that useful without each other who who wants a skyscraper without an elevator who needs an elevator without a skyscraper who wants either of them without air conditioning unless you're in quite a cold climate yeah. and to be honest what's the point of any of that unless you can get a large number of people to the skyscraper which naturally militates in favor of public transport so these things are easy to see after the fact mm. um very hard to see in advance i mean i i I try to speculate on you know, what may happen in the future of technology, but really, I mean, I'm, I'm an economist, so yeah, of course, we're vast and brilliant at forecasting, right? Um, of course. But one of the things that, that I've learned from looking at the history of technology is that you know, we are constantly blindsided, and just being quick on your feet and quick to adapt is really the, the only safe bet. Mm, yeah, well, on adapting, I'll uh, include... A link to your previous book, Adapt, for our, for our listeners. But um, I wanted to change tact and talk about the superstar economy, Tim, because I feel like this is something that not only applies in music and sport, but also in business. But perhaps we'll throw back to one Elizabeth Billington and how the invention of Edison's gramophone completely changed the game. Yeah, so Elizabeth Billington, I it, this is a nod to economic history. She was she was the greatest soprano in England. 200 years ago mm -hmm. and she reportedly you know was a lover of the prince of wales back in the day the future <laughs> king of england so, uh, so scandalous famous yeah. you know very exciting figure um but she's cited in a later paper by alfred marshall one of the founders of modern economics mm -hmm. in the late 19th century and alfred marshall says oh these new inventions like the telegraph they're creating superstar effects he doesn't use the phrase but they're expanding the influence that men of business he uses the phrase men of business doesn't <laughs> seem to have occurred to him that it would be women uh, men of business were able to to exert a much wider influence now it's not just uh, one city or one region it could be a whole country or even transatlantic cables cables reaching to india uh, they reached australia shortly afterwards um, and he says well elizabeth billington on the other hand mm -hmm. she would only ever be able to reach the people in one concert hall so marshall is writing about the impact that technology can have over the market size that a, a single person can dominate, can have control over, can profit from. But of course, for about the time that Marshall is writing, Thomas Edison invents the phonograph, and shortly after that, the gramophone is invented, and shortly after that, it becomes a, a mainstay of the music industry, and it and it creates superstar effects in music as well. Mm. So suddenly, the the best musicians in the world are the ones everyone wants to hear and can hear on a gramophone. The the fifth best, the tenth best, I mean, who cares about them? What's the point of them? So the, the income that somebody can earn changes dramatically. It could collapse or it could boom. 
just because the technology has changed, nothing about their skill, nothing about the, the hard work they put in, their moral worth, or even their adaptability. Just the world changes and um, the playing field has tilted underneath them. And we see this again and again in, in different industries, technologies creating superstar effects or sometimes removing them again because, of course, the, to some extent, the pendulum's swung back again in music. Yeah, and we see this in sport as well, and you've talked about the English um, Premier League, how as recently as the 1980s, players in the top tier earned just twice as much as those in the third tier, whereas today that gap is about 25, well, they make 25 times more than players two divisions down, and I guess that comes with broadcasting rights and the uh, vast amounts of capital and wealth that's opened up for for players, officials, and, and clubs. Yeah, and it's, it's quite a subtle argument, that, as well, because it's not just the fact that, um, oh, you know, television can reach a big audience. It's the number of channels, the number of different distribution channels. So in the 1980s, in the UK, I don't know how it was in Australia, forgive me, but in the UK, we, we basically, we only had three channels, and then um, uh, Channel 4 started up in, in the 1980s, and yeah. we used to watch, you know, great Australian soaps like Neighbours. Um, there just wasn't a lot of... Um, of broadcast time and so you wouldn't see much football on television because they're just you know not many football matches were broadcast so football was overwhelmingly still a live uh, game and the broadcasters had all the bargaining chips because you know we're only going to show one game so if you don't want us to show you know if you want to charge too much for your game we'll we'll broadcast somebody else's game then along comes sky uh, run by rupert murdoch and suddenly there's competition. There's much more broadcast space available, much more hours to fill. And suddenly the BBC and ITV and Sky are bidding against each other for the rights to show games. So, so suddenly there's a scarcity of games and there's plenty of places you might broadcast the games. So that changes the, broad, the, the bargaining power mm -hmm. and much more, much more money flows into football and of course where does it end up it ends up at the top because those are the games that people most want so it's it's not just about um the global reach of the technology but it's also about the number of different outlets um and the, the relative scarcity of football games versus places that you might broadcast football games yeah now that makes makes a hell of a lot of sense and um i was actually laughing earlier because you mentioned the, the television which uh reminds me of a national lampoon's movie with Chevy Chase where he, he and his family visit London and, and his son, his son Rusty says, hey dad, there's only four channels, I think the TV's broken. <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, yeah good, good days, good days. Good days, good days. But um, on the superstar economy team, I mean, it seems like this is now playing out at a international level when it comes to today's tech behemoths. I mean, if I go back to the 80s, you had a lot more local companies serving local customers, whereas now, rather than, say, the local taxi company, I'm more likely to jump into an Uber, which is, of course, headquartered in San Francisco and has a global footprint today. Um, and we could say the same thing about Google with advertising, um, Facebook with social, Amazon with retail, and so on. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Although we must not forget that politics still plays a role and local effects can be important, culture can be important, and local history can be important. Mm -hmm. So eBay, if I remember rightly, is um, dominant in auction markets, except in Japan, where it, it's Yahoo Auctions, yeah. because they got there first and they established themselves. Um, uh, Uber is really struggling in China, last time I looked. Um, and there are lots of uh, local competitors in many parts of East Asia, yes. uh, and and there's the, these huge price wars. And and Steve, you're closer to it than I am, so I'm sure you're more in touch with the situation. But um, there is power in that global brand. There is power in the the finance that they have, uh, and power in the fact that if I go to Sydney, I'm going to pull out my Uber app and see whether it works in Sydney. If I go to Washington DC or San Francisco, uh, I've got Uber on my phone. Um, incidentally, by the way, Uber was just banned in London. I don't know if you saw, no, uh, speak, speaking to you on the 25th of September, <clears throat> Uber was banned a couple of days ago in London. Um, it may be unbanned, but they just, they annoyed the regulators a little bit too much and the regulators just said you know you guys don't have a license to operate anymore so the local situation matters it's technology is tr tremendously important but it doesn't drive everything mm. that's an interesting one it would be interesting to see whether or not uber actually take heed 
and you know that that ban is enforced because I know they've been banned in various parts of the world, but they still still keep pushing on, and that's been I, I suppose a th- trademark of the way they do business and oftentimes they've been criticized for being overtly aggressive and just not paying attention or respecting the regulators uh demands yeah and of course they've lost a lot of goodwill Mm. um over the past few months because of uh allegations of the you know culture of sexual harassment uh travis kalanick's kind of quite pugnacious Mm -hmm. reputation association with President Trump, all of these things that have, that have sort of, I guess, weakened the the company's moral authority. And then so when a local government, as in the London uh, authorities, Transport for London, decide they're going to punch back, they do so knowing that they will have some public sympathy. And of course, Londoners are divided. A lot of Londoners find Uber very convenient. It's cheaper than the black caps. They want it. But there's also a lot of anger at Uber as well. And uh, the, the company's working quite hard to diffuse that. And it is interesting to speculate on the regulatory pushback against a lot of these companies now. Facebook's really getting blamed for uh, a lot of the woes of American politics, Mm -hmm. Twitter too, people worried about Amazon's market power. Um, And, you know, we forget that that governments have the power to push back and they may use that power wisely or not. And one of the stories in the book is about just how long uh, leaded petrol took um, before people realized that this was properly dangerous and banned it. And that was a case where government was running scared of big businesses, wasn't willing to fund research, wasn't willing to to take a stand. But in other cases, government's been very powerful and held technology back. Mm. Yeah. And um, on, on holding technology back, a conversation I had with um, uh, Kevin Kelly from Wired Magazine a little while ago was that sometimes government may prematurely regulate a technology before we even know what it's capable of. And, and in many cases, as your book clearly illustrates, technology may do something in isolation, but it may have all of these unintended consequences that we won't know until it fully plays out. So I guess it's a delicate balancing act as to when government um, intervenes, because they may be doing so uh, prematurely. But again, going back to our forecasting conversation earlier we don't know what we don't know so when is the right time it's a really hard question for for government to be answering and no it is and my personal bias is that government should should err on the side of regulating less Mm -hmm. Uh, i think i think there are always people who gain from regulations there are always lobbyists who want to who want regulations put in place for their own reasons. Uh, and it's always easy to sell regulations. Whenever anything goes wrong, people say, well, why doesn't the government do something? Um, so, uh, you know, it's harder to be a government that just sits back and says, well, we'll just we'll let the market rip and we'll see what happens. I think in the long run, um, Kevin, Kevin is right. I mean, of course, Kevin's, Kevin's right about most things. Um, uh, but, you know, it, just because government usually overregulates doesn't mean that all regulation is bad. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you've, there is a, a, there's a little bit of, about this in the book about how governments regulate incredibly complex and fast moving technologies, mm-hmm. how they get, how they work hand in hand with industry to scope out exactly how the standards or the regulation should work. It, it's not straightforward. I mean, interestingly, there is also a chapter in the book about how government can make a very uh, positive contribution to technology. Because we, I think a lot of us tend to think of government as, oh, you know, it's big and it's bureaucratic yeah. and it gets in the way. Um, but I uh, discuss the iPhone and the research of the economist Mariana Mazzucato, mm-hmm. who points out that the iPhone, which is a technology we generally you know, we Steve Jobs, right? It's Johnny Ive, it's Steve Jobs, it's Apple. Well, yeah, of course, of course, it, it is those guys, but it's not just them. If you look under the skin of the iPhone, there's a lot of innovation that was done by governments, often the American government, and and it's often the American military. So Siri, for example, was originally designed for fighter pilots, and it's it's easy to forget that and just get lost in this idea that. You know, nothing good ever comes out of government. Uh, they're all, it's full of red tape. It's full of bureaucrats. And all innovation comes out of uh, academia or Silicon Valley. Yeah. And that's just not that. Of course, a lot of stuff comes out of academia and a lot of stuff comes out of venture capital and, and startups. 
but it's it's not just that and if we if we miss the importance of government funded research we're missing something very significant yeah definitely and um i mean on government driving innovation i mean you go back to i think it was the 1960s where government procurement programs and investment in the microchip uh decreased the cost of a microchip by a factor of something like 50 in a number of I think it was two or three short years. So they definitely play a part in innovation. And I mean, if you look at the internet, computers and so on, it really does trace its roots back to Silicon Valley and, and the military more than anything else. Hey, absolutely. And, and even the algorithms used in, uh, in modern computers, the fast Fourier transform algorithms, mm. they were developed uh, originally uh, to try to detect uh, hydrogen bomb blasts, which is suddenly becoming topical again, I realize. But yes. that that was they they were American academics, mathematicians, uh, employed by the U.S. military to try to figure out how how can you spot these blasts. And the technologies they developed led to fast Fourier transforms, which which is basically the technology. I'm an economist, right? I'm not a technologist. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a physicist. But as I understand it. These are the algorithms used. Whenever you take an analog signal, like me blathering on into a microphone, you convert it into a digital single, signal, send it from Oxford, England, all the way to Australia uh, through, the, through the internet, and it's turned into a digital signal on uh, your computer, and it's eventually going to be transferred back into an analog signal you know, out, out of the, uh, the speakers in someone's phone, someone's headphones, listening to this conversation. The maths of that is government funded really is a government invention mm -hmm. which is not not a thing that we normally pay any attention to yeah and, and i guess it's a matter of government in that case or the respective government that was responsible for that doing a better job at also marketing that and making that known because if you look at steve jobs like you alluded to earlier he was a you know super talented marketer who got up on stage everybody remembers him busting out the um, first ipod saying 1000 songs in your pocket it's such an iconic moment whereas government may go off and you know like you said um create these algorithms and single-handedly play a huge role in the development of the internet and technology and computers but will not go off and promote that fact and therefore they won't get the same sense of support from the public when it comes to hey government's innovative actually no government's big and bureaucratic and slow and whatnot so maybe there is a, a lesson there in government to actually you know share their wins and celebrate them it could be and, and of course it it depends with which which audience you're talking to so a lot of people who would say you know the private sector never does anything good they're just you know selfish you know profit seeking uh, money grubbing people and you know and we need more government funding so I mean different people people have their own preconceptions they have their own politics um, they have their own views of the world and one of the things that's been fun working on the book was because I was able to take 50 different technologies 50, 50 different ideas I was able to say well there's actually there's, there's no hard and fast rule there's no big picture that this is always the way it happens like this is always how invention happens or government always gets in the way or government always helps or um you know lone inventors uh, are always responsible for great inventions or, or lone inventors never invent anything it's always a team or, or and every every story you could tell every cliche that you've heard about technology seems to be true about you know one of these inventions uh, at some stage and the, one of the fun things about working on the book has been, well, there is no obvious pattern to a lot of this stuff. 50 good stories, 50 interesting insights, but there's no great big, it's not the tipping point, right? It's not, there's, no, there's no overarching theme of everything. Yeah. Um, so, um, which is, you know, it's been fun to not to have to try to force a structure on everything. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's something that authors often do when they have a particular theory and then they'll find a bunch of case studies that support that theory uh, and, you know, that whole confirmation bias. And, and that's one thing that I really like about this book, which it doesn't do that. And one thing that I really like about this book is that as someone who has, say, a tendency to exhibit unit bias, and once I start something, I need to finish it, once I start a four page chapter in your book Tim it's very easy to finish it as opposed to say a 40 page chapter in, in some books so uh, it's it's a very uh, rewarding um, and enjoyable read I have to say yeah it's, it, it was it was fun to work on those those small uh, chapters they were originally designed to be nine minute 
podcast. Mm. It's about 12, 1,200 words. So, I mean, nine minutes for me to read them on the radio, probably three or four minutes to read them in print, if that. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's enough time to say something, but it's never enough time to say everything. Mm. And so you have, you have to choose, and it's a great discipline. And I feel that um, it's been good for me as a writer – that constraint. I mean, I know this is a, this is an old idea about the power of constraints on yeah. uh, the creative process, but having to say, look, you've the nine minutes is a, it's a really hard stop. The podcast because the podcasts were also broadcast on the BBC World Service. Mm -hmm. You can't go more than nine minutes, so you can't go more than twelve hundred words. So that's it. That's it. Um, away you go. Now, for the book, I was able to relax the constraint a little bit. So there was one chapter on double entry bookkeeping, where there's just so much stuff. There's so much history. That chapter is is probably 1600 words, not 1200 words. But generally, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't kind of let the chapters bloat. I enjoyed them at that, that nice, tight mm. level. Uh, and I enjoyed having to make choices and say, well, you know, there's another great story I could tell, but I just there's, there's no time so you just get the one fantastic yeah well it, it goes back to uh if i had more time i'd write a shorter letter and it seems you've done well at doing that um with these 1200 to 1400 word chapters but um in the interest of time i wanted to cover off on one or two more topics tim and one of the things you've alluded to in a couple times in the book is some research conducted by uh eric brinjolfson i hope i pronounced that mm -hmm. correctly and lauren hitt um which found that well they did they did this research in the year 2000 and they found that companies that invested in technology for, for little or no reward. Or rather, they found that many companies invested in technology for little or no reward, um, but others reap massive, massive benefits. And I guess today we're seeing that with a lot of these digital transformation projects where companies are just taking old broken processes and digitizing them and expecting that to work. But ultimately, like with the transition from, say, steam to electricity, you couldn't just take the new system and install it in your old sort of framework and policies and everything else, you needed to redesign everything that goes on around that in order to really reap the benefits. And most companies aren't willing to do that. No, absolutely. So the, the electricity parallel, a parallel between electricity and manufacturing and uh, information technology today was drawn by uh, an economic historian called Paul David. And I'll, I'll let people read the book or listen to the podcast or they can look up Paul David's work if they want. But um, the, the basic insight is um, you can just replace a great big steam engine with a great big electric motor. It does work. It does the job. But you're not really enjoying the advantages that the, the electric motor gives you in terms of uh, just a new architecture for factories, a new workflow, new responsibilities for workers, just it wants you realize that it, it's not just a direct replacement for the old technology. All kinds of other things become possible. And Paul David said, writing in 1990, maybe this is true for information technology. And then Bryn Jolson, who's become very famous um, for his work recently with Andrew McAfee, various books they've written, The Second Machine Age and so on. Um, Bryn Jolson, working with Lauren Hitt in the year 2000, said, can we do some empirical research to back up Paul David's um, instinct on this. And they studied firms that in the 80s and 90s had gone through these process of, uh, processes of digital transformation. And what they found in a nutshell was, if you just buy the computers, it's not going to work. And if you reorganize your company, but you don't buy the computers, that's not going to work. But if you reorganize your company and you buy the computers, then you really unlock something. And the kinds of reorganizations they were talking about, which now seem very familiar, I think, were decentralization, um, more customization. So you're, you're taking advantage of the ability to, to tailor make products and services for individuals because computers make that very easy. Um, you're, you're, uh, you're streamlining uh, various decision making processes. You're stripping out hierarchies. There's a lot of this stuff going on and it seems to be very effective when it's coupled with a technology. And the general message of this is, 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 is it's a difficult one because it's easy to say, it's, it's hard to do, is technology always tends to lead to social and organizational change if you're going to use it right. It doesn't just fit into the old patterns. You need to do something new. You need to change. And of course, change is always difficult and it's always hard to do it in the right way. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's probably why, according to research, 
that I've come across recently, 90% of today's digital transformation projects fail to really deliver the benefits that they were sought after and oftentimes amount to failures. But that's a whole different uh, podcast episode there. Um, so my last question for you, Tim, is if you were the last person on earth, well, maybe not the last person, but one of the few survivors, because if you were the last person, then it doesn't matter what you did, uh, mankind would be destined to, to doom. Would you pick up a plow? I guess I would try. That is that is the way that the book begins. It's also the way that a great uh, TV series from the 1970s begins, James Burke's Connections. Uh, but the the idea is, what is this all built on? Everything around us, our, our cities, our culture, our literature, science, it's all built on the ability to generate an agricultural surplus that you can put in a barn and that someone else can then tax and and build all kinds of things out of and that agricultural surplus is built on the plow so the plow is the very first invention in the book because it shows this is not just a solution to the problem of we need more crops uh, we need more food this is a technology that changes the way we live who wins who loses uh, the balance of power and enables and unlocks all kinds of other technologies and so it's the perfect prelude for a book about how 50 different inventions shape the modern economy. Yep, and our audience should definitely pick up a copy of the book to figure out or to find out exactly how the plow impacted so many other facets of our our world as we know it today. So people can pick up a copy of the book at Amazon. They can find out more about Tim if they don't already know enough about you by listening to this show at timharford.com. They can vote on the 51st thing at timharford.com as well. And they can hit you up on Twitter at Tim Harford. And also they can check out the podcast, which is on iTunes. And yeah, check that out, everyone. 50 things that made the modern economy. And I think we need to let you go. It's great to talk to you, Steve. Thanks Likewise, so much. Ho hopefully no one will beat the record. Hopefully not. <laughs> Always a pleasure, Tim. All right. Take Thanks, care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys. It's Steve again. If you're picking up what we're putting down, we'd love it if you took just a minute of your time to like, share, or subscribe to Future Squared on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. It would mean a hell of a lot to the team here who work effortlessly to bring you thought leaders and experts on topics of corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement on a weekly basis. As always, you can find more resources on innovation, including blogs, books, podcasts, videos, webinars, and tools at www.collectivecamp.us. If you'd like to connect with me on Twitter, you can do so at Steve Golovesky. That's G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I. Until next time, keep innovating. Future Squared out.